Before we begin today's video, I want to give you a heads up. On Saturday, August 26th, 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, we're going to begin the first in our live stream series where we have real-time interaction between us and the audience. We'll discuss science, engineering, technology, current events. We'll try to answer your questions, take your comments, take your suggestions, as well as your criticisms. We'll be able to cover anything that you're interested in talking about, including things that we've covered in previous videos and plans that we have for future videos. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I am too. And you should be too, because this took us a long time to set up. Weeks. Weeks. <laughs> took a long time. That's why we've been going. And what you see on the live stream is going to be a little bit different than this because we have some extra camera angles set up. We've got some cool voice controllers and voice options to mess with. Uh, we'll have a live chat on there. We have video switchers and everything that we could possibly need. And as he just pointed to, we might have some guests in the future. So if you'd like to see our next live stream and the ones coming after that, you should subscribe to our Twitter page right here, which is at T underscore ingredients. Make sure you follow us on there because it, we might be changing that username. And if we do and you're not following it, you'll have to use the link in the description. If you are following it, you'll stay subscribed. So make sure you do that quickly. So hope to see you there. Look forward to it. Yeah, it'll be fun. Hi. Over the years, we've done a fair number of videos on acoustics and sound. We did a video on active sound cancellation. We also studied the effects of sound transmission through helium and other solid materials. And we've built a number of speaker systems. One of them, kind of unusual, called the DML speaker, or Distributed Mode Loudspeaker. And what's interesting about it is, like any conventional speaker, it depends on what's called an actuator or an exciter or a driver. It's a voice coil where you have a moving coil of wire in a magnetic field that is driven by a varying current from the amplifier. In a typical loudspeaker, this driver is hooked up to a membrane or a diaphragm that increases its surface area. And as that diaphragm moves back and forth under the influence of the driver, it produces compressed air waves or pulses, and that is the sound from the loudspeaker. A DML works in a different method. What happens is that the exciter causes the material that it's attached to to flex and to bend and to ripple, and it produces sound just like a musical instrument. We covered how to construct these and the principles behind their operation in the previous videos. And we've got a lot of positive response from people who've built these speakers. They like the sound, they like the ease of construction, and they also like the low cost. We got from a few viewers a very intriguing question. If this, in fact, sounds so good when it's attached to cardboard or glass or a piece of styrofoam, what would happen if you attached it to a musical instrument. So, over the last year or so, I have been um, doing a little bit of a treasure hunt. eBay, Craigslist, uh, yard sales, and I've acquired a collection of somewhat tired spring, string instruments, uh, in other words, low cost. And I began testing them, and I developed a method for attaching these exciters to the front of these instruments. And the results were amazing. In a few seconds, I'm going to show you how to do that. It's not complicated. But once we completed several of these instruments, today we decided to take our little ensemble out into the field and get the response from the public to what this sounds like. I hope you enjoy it. So setting up one of these instruments is easy to do, but there are a few important points. First of all, they do not operate if they are in contact with the surface. It really dampens the vibration. They need to hang free. Now, if they still have the neck and the peg box attached to the top, you can certainly just hang them from those. But if that's damaged or you decide to remove them to make this more compact, you can take advantage of the thick piece of wood at that interface and screw into it a small eye bolt that would allow you then to attach a thread or a piece of fishing line. Do not simply 
put a single peg in there and hang it. Because even indoors in a room, someone just passing by and these things are gonna just swing and rotate like this, it'd be very annoying, they'll bang the walls. You wanna mount this so that you have two contact points with the line. And because it's very difficult to be able to cut two thin lines exactly the same length, the simpler thing to do is simply form a loop out of your thread. I don't know if you can see this on the camera because it's so fine. But you take the loop, attach it to one of the eye bolts, and then you can simply connect it to the rear eye bolt. And now you have two points to support it. And in addition, because it's a loop, it will self-level. So this works much better, maintains nice orientation, damps rotation, very effective. That's what I did with all the other instruments. Now the next thing is attaching the actuator. Now I thought at first it'd be really cool to put the actuators on the back of the instrument so that nobody would know how these things are being driven. It doesn't work very well. These things are designed the way they are for a very specific purpose of generating sound. The thickness of the wood, the shape, the scrolls. And so the best place to put the actuator is the same location where the strings would normally transmit the vibrations into the body of the instrument. In other words, the bridge. Now, if you look at the scrolls that the bridge is already gone, there are often a couple of little notches in the scrolls that are just about the same height as the bridge. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is to center the actuator, take a ruler or a scale, measure across at that point where the notches are located, and then just place a small dot at the center that you're gonna use as a reference for where we're gonna put the actuators. Now, the actuators come in a variety of different power ratings and sizes. And sometimes the manufacturer will include a frequency response for each one of the actuators, but these less expensive ones generally don't have that. As a good rule of thumb, the smaller the actuator, the lower the power rating, the higher the frequency response. So what I found works very well is the three to five watt actuators, the very smallest ones, work well with a viola or a violin. The 25 watt actuators work well with something the size of a cello. And for a bass or a double bass, you wanna use the 40 watt actuators and maybe even double them up. The reason you would do that is not because of the power requirements, but because the actuator and the wood of the instrument are actually working as a system, both are moving. And so if the mass of the wood is similar to the mass of the actuator, you get the best impedance matching. And so that's why the additional mass works well on a double base. Now, the second thing to keep in mind is that these little systems, or these little actuators, come with double sticky tape already from the manufacturer with a little backing to keep it from sticking to everything. And this tape is really good. You pull off the backing and it will stick permanently to just about any surface. It's almost impossible to remove it. The only way I found it is successful is to take a razor blade and literally slice through the tape. And I've done that on a couple of these actuators. I've used them several times. And when you cut the, the tape off, you can actually purchase these little discs of pre-cut double sticky tape. So you can reapply this and replace an actuator or change an actuator out. The other issue is that this is mounted on a plain flat surface. And we're going to try to couple that to the front surface of these instruments. And all of them have complex convex curvature that even change over the entire face of the instrument. So if we were to simply try to stick this to the front of the instrument, it would only be contacting at two points. We wouldn't get good coupling. So we want to make an interface block so that we get good coupling. And the way to do that is get a rod of some sort of material. I like using plastic because it's isotropic. There's no grain structure. It's not going to fracture like wood, but it might work. I just haven't gone the way of testing out wood. Make sure that the outer diameter of the rod that you're going to use is at least the size of the outside of the tape so we get good contact. And then drill a hole in the center of the rod. The purpose of the hole is simply to allow you to see the dot that you marked when you're going to be centering this. It doesn't really matter how big it is. Just don't make it so big that it's bigger than the ID of your tape so that you get good contact. And then to keep the actuator flat to the surface, you want to thin this out. So just slice this off about three to four millimeters or about an eighth of an inch works just fine. One surface, you're going to leave perfectly flat. 
the other surface, we're going to form the, the same curvature as we have in the violin. So the first thing we're going to do is mark this on the surface we're not going to change with a couple of dots or a couple of lines 180 degrees apart. This will maintain our orientation as we're fabricating the curve. And then we're going to take a piece of sandpaper. I like using 220 grits. A little slow, but it gives you a nice surface when you're done. Place it over the location where you're going to be mounting the actuator and then keeping the lines vertical. We're going to begin rubbing this back and forth across that surface. Now, when I do that, you start to see this roughness on the surface near the middle. That's where it's first cutting in. As you continue to do this, and sometimes just to even this out, I'll rotate it a full 180, just in case I'm pushing down differently with my fingers, and keep going. Eventually, when we bring this out enough, you're going to see that roughness extend all the way to the edge. That means we've coupled the um, two surfaces. If your paper starts to load up where you're working, don't go over to where you've got fresh sandpaper. Move the paper over so that we're always cutting or grinding off the material in the same location. Hmm, we're getting there. Rotate this again, and I'm going to need another piece of paper. And it's actually easier to do this on the bigger instruments because the curvature is less. The violin is actually the most difficult, it takes the most amount of time. And because the curvature changes top to bottom, don't get crazy and go the full length of the big piece of paper thinking you're going to save time because the curvature is actually changing. That's why I'm kind of forced to make small strokes. Yeah, I got it. All right, so now we're going to clean this off with a little bit of alcohol. Just to get any dust off of here. And try not to mark, remove your marks. Uh, just because once I screwed up and I put the wrong surface down, and once you glue it down, <laughs> you're screwed. So, okay. So we got our marks. We got our curvature. Now we want to attach this. And one of the things with um, your glue choice is that typically string instruments use wood glue. But I find that for this application, I like using the epoxy a little bit more simply because it doesn't need the air to get underneath to cause it to dry. It'll cure on its own in about five or 10 minutes and it's very strong. So we're gonna go ahead and mix up some epoxy here. Get on some gloves. And stay away from the one minute epoxy. It's too fast. It'll dry before you get the thing all put together. And again, I have wasted some parts doing that. So let's get a piece of paper for my debris. Measure off a little bit of this. Stir it up. And notice I'm using the cup in the opposite direction. I actually like these solo cups for mixing adhesives. And for small quantities, it's actually easier to mix it on the bottom uh, because it's a little concave and you don't have to be digging into the cup trying to get the stuff out. Okay. I'm going to get rid of this one. And we get a fresh stick. Take the disc without the mark sides and we'll begin applying it to this. And this is the reason for the gloves. Even if you don't think you're going to touch it, you will in this step because it will get on the edges. And you don't need much. You just need to wet the entire surface. And I'm just going to keep this around as a bit of a guideline so we know when this dries. Then make sure that you orient this the way that you were grinding it. And you can barely see my dot. I almost cleaned it off with the alcohol here. But I just detect it. And then once you place it down, you've got it centered, then just give it a little bit of a squeeze to make sure it's down there. Securely. And then don't go away. There's a temptation to say, oh, okay, I'm done, and I'm just going to come back in an hour. 
If you haven't perfectly leveled your instrument, what will happen is this thing could drift off to the side and cure while you're gone. And then again, you're screwed because you're never gonna get this thing apart without damaging the surface of the, of the instrument. So just keep an eye on this for a few minutes. And when you're perfectly, perfectly happy with the alignment, this will be ready in about 10 minutes for the next step. Perfect. Okay, now the next step is to attach the actuator. So take a little forceps, remove the double sticky tape, or remove the uh, backing on the double sticky tape. Like this. Now, like I said, this stuff sticks to everything. So you wanna make sure that you get the orientation correct before you press it down. And you can put the uh, leads either up or down, whichever way that you prefer. Now, I'm gonna center this as close as I can to the right position. Make sure I get this perfect before I touch it, because once you touch it, it's gonna stay there. Perfect. Okay, now you can have the leads pre-attached, but I find that it tends to kind of tether the actuator and sometimes even pull it off before you get it down. So I preferred using the attach after the fact technique. So a piece of cloth over the instrument to protect it. And then we're just gonna put a little bit of solder onto the two leads like this. And notice that one of them, the left one for me, I guess right one for you, had a little red dot on it. That's the positive polarity. And you wanna keep the polarities with the same white color so that you're good. Okay. And then we'll attach this. First the ground. Good. And then we'll do the positive lead. And you're done. You can just hook this up to whatever kind of connectors or extenders you want, plug them into a stereo amplifier, keeping the positive and the ground polarity straight, and you're ready to go. Kind of neat, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we run a YouTube channel. Okay. And we do science and technology engineering videos. And a couple of months ago, we did a video on what's called distributed mode loudspeakers. It's where you take the driver yep. and you attach it to a wall, a window, styrofoam, cardboard, and they make remarkable instruments. So somebody on our comment section says, well then why don't you hook it up to a real instrument? Yeah. So I scrounged around Craigslist and everything, found some old instruments, put the drivers on them, and now they make sound, and it's not just the strings, they make voice, you know, they make, like, listen. Kind of neat, huh? So they become like a speaker? Yeah, they basically become resonators. See, these things right here, you can buy them on Amazon, you can buy them on little like parts supply houses. The real little ones that go on the violins are about $4. These things are like $14. Mm -hmm. And you just glue them where the old bridge was. Mm -hmm. 
and then you run the wires to an amplifier just like a regular speaker. There's nothing else like high tech or electronic about it. And you just have to position them right because they are designed to be driven at the bridge where the string goes over. That's where they want to be driven. That's what the sound is, yeah. Right. And so you use more powerful actuators on bigger instruments like the bass. You can use tiny actuators on these things. And actually, they work better because they're higher frequency. So they play higher tones. But you can imagine, like, say you got a TV room or something, and you hang all these violins, and then you keep scrounging around. Oh, I found another viola. I found another cello. And yeah. all of a sudden, you got an orchestra in your room. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, the whole thing cost about $200. Wow. You know, so not bad. Not bad at all. Yeah. And we wanted to bring it out here just to get an impression of, like, what people thought of the sound, you know, who don't have a bias, and share kind of, like, how they're put together at the same time that we're showing them that we do this channel. You know, it's a bit of a promotion for the channel. And then everything is run from a solar panel because obviously we don't have right. plugs out here. So, kind of neat. Well, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And they reproduce sound really, really well and not just the sound of a cello. So it can make vocal, trumpets, drums, pianos, doesn't matter. Through that vehicle. Through that vehicle. And so, the whole concept is for a couple hundred dollars, somebody at their house with a little glue and a few actuators can build a set of speakers like this. You hang them up at your house, your church. It's kind of, it's pretty, it's aesthetic. And at the same time, it sounds really good. So, so that's what we're hearing. That's what you're hearing. So we're not selling anything. We're not marketing. We're just sort of showing our viewers how people react to these weird speakers. Oh, isn't that neat? Yeah, yeah. And it's fun. Yes, thanks for stopping by. Turns out that you can make sound just by connecting these little electronic things to windows and cardboard and boxes and shoe boxes and everything. And they make pretty good music. They actually use them on the inside of vending machines. So when they say, you know, your Coke is ready or your coffee is ready, because they don't want vandalism. So it's inside the metal so that you can't, you know, damage it. But they're real cheap. And when we hooked them up to the, uh, the cardboard, they sounded so good that one of the viewers said, why don't you just hook it up to a musical instrument? Wow. And so when we did, it's like it sounds so much better. Beautiful. Yeah, and so it's like, I'll turn it on, but I can turn it down. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That one's the cleanest. Yeah, and actually, that's, that's one of the oldest ones. It's so clean, why is it old then? Well, because I refinished it. It looked like this before, and I fixed it. This one's 127 years old. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Older than me. What about the other one? The other one's, I don't know. It's probably 10 years old. I don't know. Sometimes if you look inside, they put a little, little date. But I couldn't see anything in that one. It might have fallen off, too, even if they put it in there. Germany? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I can see the paper but I can't read it. Does it say what year? US zone. Hmm. Some place in Germany. So anyway, it was kind of fun and I think what's interesting is a lot of people find the aesthetics, an important part of it. It's like the music quality is good, but the fact that you can hang these things up and it doesn't look like a pink piece of styrofoam, the fact that it would look good inside of a church, inside of a theater, your home, that might help you with your spouse. I just want to feel how hot it is. Oh, it's probably hot, yeah. No, actually, it's not as bad as it was. Hi. Good, how are you? Did you, you interested? For a sec? We turned it off if you want. You want to see it? Go ahead, take a peek at it. We're not a band. We're a YouTube channel. We do technical videos and we show how to make these. That way you don't have to practice for six years before you can play them. Kind of neat, huh? I'll turn them real soft. Hang on a second. It'll be loud for a second. Yeah. 
These little things are where the sound is coming from. If you feel them, you can feel them vibrate. Feel it. Right here. Put your hand on it, you'll feel it vibrating. See? So this is like a speaker. They turned it into a speaker. How cool is that, huh? <laughs> kind of neat. What's the YouTube? Look at his YouTube channel. Not bad for two hundred dollars. In other words, you can bucks? you can build it yourself for two hundred dollars. We don't what? sell them. We just show people how to do technical videos and so that sort of thing. Teaching ingredient or tech, teching. Tech. Tech. tech ingredients. Ingredients.com. Yeah. And again, a lot of people that came by said, well, I hope you sell a lot. And it's like, no, we're just technical video. We show people how to build projects yeah, at home yeah, yeah. and want to get some feedback. And, you know, it'd be kind of neat to be able to put something like that together. My wife, when I put the first ones in the house, they were styrofoam. And she's like, they really sound good. But they're really ugly. And so <laughs> someone said, well, then why don't you just put it on a guitar? And it's like, oh, yeah, that's pretty clever. And when I did, it was like, ooh. Well, you know. turn the cup upside down. That's what I used yeah. to do. <laughs> cup on the side to put the phone in there. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, that's a really neat thing. Like, as it works as a resonator or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like a little resonator, yeah. Yeah. What does this part do? Well, we didn't Just allow... The wind? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. When we set it up in the shop, yeah. it was great. But as soon as we came out here, just this little bit of breeze, and they were all over the place. So that's not part of the underlying design. The design like this is just you hang them in your room and you know it sounds great. But outdoors we didn't allow for the fact that these things would swing like crazy in just a little tiny breeze. So they're just to keep things from going too wonky. So what is this part here? What it is is the back of the actuator is a flat disc. Okay. And so you would normally put it on a window or you'd put it on say the inside of a vending machine. Okay. or you put it on something that's flat. Yep. And so a double sticky tape, you peel it off, comes from the manufacturer, stick it on, wire it up, and you're good. Problem is, because these things are curved, this won't attach well. It'll just sort of rock, it okay. won't attach. So you just take a little piece of plastic and rub it on some sandpaper across here until it picks up the curve. Yep. Then you glue the plastic to this, and then the plastic to this. It so acts this as an a interface. So is sensor for somebody trying to break into something? No, actually they're made to do exactly this. These are like, those are like four bucks. These are like six. You put them in vending machines. Was it almost like the magnet of like a subwoofer? It's, Just it's the, the driver part? of a speaker. Okay. So there's a, a magnetic, a uh, magnet and then a coil and the coil moves. Yeah, so it's just the coil and the, and the magnet. Yeah, right, and the coil pushes so you're on the surface. So you vibration into this instead of like a polyethylene in and then foam. Instead of a big diaphragm of rubber yeah. or paper, we're just using the wood and the wood itself resonates. And so it, you know, it amplifies, resonates, you know, picks up the very tiny vibrations, amplifies them. And so they're much better than just using a simple piece of cardboard or something. Awesome. Yeah, and they're, they're, what's nice about them is like you can throw one of these together in about 10 minutes. Yeah. And you can scrounge. So like that's 127 years old. That one I don't know where it came from. This one I picked up on eBay for like 39 well, the bucks. Neck breaks it, and everything too, that's yeah. Useless too. You got another reuse out of it. Yeah. So you just keep your eyes open. You could build a whole orchestra for you know a few hundred dollars, and oh, that's really cool. everybody comes over to your house and you're like, what the heck is that? It's like. Well, it's just some little thing I invented, yeah. you know, and so it's kind of, it's a conversation starter and everything. Plus the music's pretty good. It's better than having a speaker out in your little pool house or something. Yeah. That's much cooler. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was thinking on each side of a big, like, television or something, like you put like three or four of these things. Yeah. And you get like that stereo effect. And what's neat is they play music, like you'd think this will sound like a cello. But no, it'll sound like a piano, it'll sound like a man singing, it'll sound like a trumpet, it'll sound like anything, as long as you put that into it. You can put anything hollow in a store, then hook one of these up to it, Yep. and then have music going through anywhere, really. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The original videos that we did, we just used pieces of styrofoam, like squares cut out from Home Depot, just yeah. like two by two squares, and pieces of cardboard, cut a box apart, yeah. and put them on the box, and then just mounted them. The lighter the stuff is, the thinner and lighter and more resonant it is, the more you can couple the energy into yeah. it. So if you take a big piece of aluminum or a heavy piece of MDF or plywood, yep. no good. It doesn't work. It doesn't bend, it doesn't flex, and it can't move. You know, this thing's just too light. You have to ask. <laughs> Thank you, man. Sure. I take it easy. Time. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Yep. Hi. You interested in looking at these? 
I've got the volume turned way down so it wouldn't intimidate anybody. But they're, they're speakers. We scrounged up a bunch of uh, string instruments uh, online and Craigslist and that sort of thing. Because uh, our channel, I don't know if my son told you very much about it, but we do technical videos. And when we built some original video, some speakers based on this little driver and pieces of cardboard, they sounded so good that people said, put them on instruments. It wasn't our idea, but it was a good idea. And so we put them on these. In the video, we show people how to do this. Like, where can you buy one of these? How can you mount it? How do you hook it up to your, your stereo system? And how do you hang them so that they'll work right? But what about the big one? What's the this is called a double bass, and that's just a big version of a violin. And because it's so big, you hear how low it is? So when somebody plays it with a string, it plays the real low sounds. Yeah. And so the, the low stuff that you hear comes better out of here. Like, I'll turn it off. Watch. See how flat it is? No, no low sound. That's where the low is coming from. High, medium, low. It all makes sense. So we just brought it out here to get people's impression of it and kind of show them how it can work and try to deal with the wind. <laughs> Are you like um, taping this for? We're, we're filming me as I sort of describe this stuff to people as well as like I did an introduction to explain what's going on. We started out in the shop, in the lab, and I showed people how to glue these on, how to solder them up, how to connect the wires, but then it gets kind of boring. Very inexpensive, just simple amplifiers like you might have at home. Uh -huh. These are very inexpensive, not very powerful. So violins, cellos, and the bass. So that way I could turn the bass off, I can turn the cellos, lose the mid-range, get the mid-range, lose the high. So it's kind of neat because you can control it and balance it and everything. And it's super inexpensive. You know, you can do this at home with a little bit of glue. You just glue these, you buy these, you glue them onto the front, and then just wire them up like any speaker would be wired up. Just put the red and the black in the red and black hole and wire them up. And once you've built it, you've got a speaker. And once you know kind of some of the rules about hanging it up, and you know some of the rules about big ones for this one, tiny ones for that one. Once you know those rules, you can kind of, you're on your own and you can build as many of them as you want and keep looking around for another cello and everybody's wondering why you're accumulating an orchestra in your garage. Got it. Got it? Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, take a look at it. Yeah, we will. Okay. Thank you very much for the time. Uh, come on. Card valid, okay. Oh, is it just, okay. Yeah, well, because it ends at seven. Oh, I see, okay, so, so it you don't auto, need any more. Yeah, it auto. Let okay. me show you. We are a YouTube channel, okay. and uh, STEM, yeah, Science, Engineering, you. Technology. Yeah, enjoy the conversation. You too. Yeah, Appreciate thank you. It. And so what we do is we do science and engineering videos and uh, we've done a bunch on acoustics and speakers. So we showed people over a last year or two how to make speakers that are called DML speakers. Okay. And that means distributed mode loudspeakers. Yeah. And that's what a DML is as opposed to a regular loudspeaker, a transmissive loudspeaker. So we decided to set it up, put it in front here, and then just get people's reactions to like what you're doing. Is this geeky or is this kind of cool? You know, <laughs> and we've had, 
we've had like a, we had an opera guy here yeah. that came and started singing along with the songs oh, cool. and that we had a couple of couples and some kids came by and that kind of thing but it was the mix of all the different people asking like what is that really or what's your channel name and that yeah. kind of stuff yeah i was watching there's a program there's a channel called like cnc like kings or yeah. something like that and they were demonstrating some god awful huge CNC machine from some German company. Yep. Yep. And they put this big chunk of metal in there. Mm -hmm. And then their, you know, 25 year old, like, you know, software person programs this in. The old machinists are standing around like this. And this thing just takes off and like metal is flying everywhere. And the thing comes out and it's like, it's all done perfect. and it's perfect. And it's like, no, no centering, no nothing. It's just like, it's so unfair. Yeah. It's like, you know, it shouldn't be allowed, you know, it's just. Well, just like your instruments, I yeah, don't right. know how much you want to bet people in the 1750s would be complaining about how you're playing it off pressing a button. Yeah, yeah. so it's so, that, like you, know. you need to spend 15 years, you know, in a cold yeah, room, yeah. you know, learning how to do this. And it's like... And then switch to a violin. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So, but anyway, take a look at the channel because I think you might find that, you know, the stuff we do, okay. it gets pretty high end, but I always try to keep it where it's right at the bitter edge of what like a common average education would get somebody to be able to say i get it but i didn't know that yeah. or i get this i believe you but oh wow that's an interesting thing mm. it's a delicate balance oh, yeah. but it seems like i think we've hit it kind of about right where we're staying right at that balance point sure. so you might find something okay. in there that's yeah. interesting yeah and i do sing with a group of the concord corral we just finished a concert oh yeah oh uh, uh, where the concert was held in Keene, because we, oh, okay. we sang with the Keene Corral as well. Okay. And we also sang at the Bow High School. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, wow. About half of them will be a cappella. Can you, can you do me a little a cappella of something that you're, like, real comfortable with that would just be, like, just give me a touch? Okay. You like Tchaikovsky? Yes. Not Tchaikovsky. Um, Strauss? No. I'm 71. I got the CRS disease. You know, can't remember shit. Uh, uh, and if you want to, if you want to face Stravinsky. Nope. Uh, yeah, can, uh, can you face this way? Oh, oh, oh geez. Uh, well, come on. <laughs> if you're going to sing. I was going to keep it secret, but come on. No, come on. You're going to do it in front of a crowd. And, so. where, where is it going to be? Take and YouTube. YouTube. Just on YouTube. Just yeah. on YouTube. <laughs> Ave Maria, gratia plena, Maria, gratia plena, Maria, gratia plena. Ave, Ave Dominus, Dominus Tecum, Ia. Schubert. You were holding that Schubert yeah, in right. because you needed to finish. Yeah. And you were like, oh, I know it now, I know it now, <laughs> right? Through a right. I got it. <laughs> it came, it came, it came. Yeah, right. That that's, was good though. That was choice. That's <laughs> choice on a street without a warning and out of breath walking down the street. Yes. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah. That was good. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you want to play it right now? Are you interested in what we're demonstrating here? We're not selling anything. We're just yeah. teaching. We Wait, have a. Can you turn this off? Okay. So you can have my undivided attention. <laughs> okay. Right. Basically, we're just teaching people about acoustics and how they work and basically how you can apply some simple principles to make your own speakers and sound devices. And we have a YouTube channel where we do STEM sorts oh, of yeah? education. And this is one example of something that you can build for $10, $15 if you can scrounge up some old used instruments and use them as sound resonators for electronic drivers like this. My, that son, are, my son would really be into this. Oh, we seem to get people who are either musicians or like electronics people. They're like, oh. He's both. Well, then he would go crazy. He's an engineer, but this is what his real passion is. Right, that's, that's it. Uh, 
you tell them about it, tell them about the channel. We'll probably post this video that I'm doing right now. We'll probably post this video in about two weeks. And what it does, it starts out with, we've done a whole bunch of things on speakers and sound and acoustics, and we've shown you how you can change the sound quality of rooms and all that sort of stuff. But we got a bunch of comments to say, you should apply this to actual musical instruments. See if you could make sound out of them. Is this based on frequencies too? It very much is. Like for example, you see, if you look like more carefully, you see how those little actuators on the violins are much smaller than these. Yeah. They don't need so much power, but they have to operate at a higher frequency. So those things are driven to give the high pitch, the female voices, the violins, the right. high piano. Yeah. The cellos, kind of somewhere in the middle, and the double bass actually needs two of these to run. But it turns out the post is located here, not here. Yeah, you can see some distortion in the way. The reason the post is supposed to be here, it's not just sort of this is a 80 year old instrument, is because when you have the strings over the bridge right here, down to there, what happens is these strings are different. These are the low pitch strings. These are the fine high pitch strings. So they tune the box so that the high pitch strings interact with the higher pitch resonance of the instrument. So yeah. they have all different types of vibrational no, it's, modes. Just the, just the um, I, yes, all of them have the posts and all of them are asymmetric because all of them have strings right. that go from high to low. Yeah. So that's what they did when they designed these things and probably they didn't have the computer programs and everything, but they said, hey, we put the post in and it works really well, but guess what, I put it off center, it works even better, sir. <laughs> okay, apprentice, we'll put them all in over here and we'll sell more of the instruments because ours sound better. That's probably how science was done 200 years ago. And now I learned how it worked. Yep. <laughs> so anyway, that's basically what it is. And then I just show them, how can you mount these? How do you select these? How do you make them work? Connect them up to a stereo system and you can play music. And the nice Wait, thing... You, so I'm missing a step. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going fast. What happens is scrounge up an old instrument that yeah. you can get cheap and then remove the neck, remove the strings, remove the bridge, and place an electric actuator that fools the instrument into thinking there's a string there. Okay. Then connect up those electronic motion machines up to a stereo or an amplifier like we have over here. Okay. Like any radio inside your house that right. would normally drive a regular speaker. Right. So it's very simple. It's very sort of like you would need about four sentences on an instruction sheet. And the only trick is like, how do you get them to stick and how do you, you know, position them right? Yeah. Okay. But once you do that, it's pretty much does autopilot. It, does the stick uh, make a difference in the impact? Uh, does the stick? Oh yes. Yeah, if the stick. No, the sticking stuff. Oh, it does. Well, that's an interesting question. What happens is you want the movement of this to be transmitted as efficiently to this as possible. So right. if you have a big spongy stick, a lot of the energy is wasted in just compressing and stretching the So is this, is this essentially acting like a bass? This is acting like a large double bass sized sound resonator. It's amplifying a speaker. A speaker. Yeah, it's a I, speaker. I don't know why you need to add well, all these. I get, I get so technical, but the, yeah, it's, yeah, a it's a speaker. So you can play a piano through it, you could play a trumpet through it, you can play a voice through it, you can oh, really? play any kind of sound. This is a speaker? We'll, yeah, yeah, okay. we'll play some music for you. He's making it more complicated. Too complicated, than right. Well, that's okay. I well, can. that's my job is to make things complicated. His job is to make it clear. <laughs> <laughs> a little smaller than the Mormon tabernacle, yeah, just bit. two, but... How do I find the, the video you taped the other day? I can't find it. Oh, well, we oh. haven't posted yet. Oh, oh, to put we're it accumulating a, long time a lot. Yeah, it might be two weeks before it's up. Okay. Yeah, but you will be in it, I guarantee. Oh, okay. Yes. You were the most interesting person that we had because you were singing and everything. Yeah. Otherwise, everybody else was sort of like, oh, that's interesting and... Thanks. Cool, yeah. bye. Yeah. yeah, but I had been in electronics, so it does... Right. Does, well, that too. Bit, right. You know, right. And right. The, the policeman was pretty interesting yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, he's a banjo player. Oh, really? Yeah, so he, he's yeah. kind of, well, that was after you and yeah. kind of when we were getting ready to, to pack, uh, pack up. But he was kind of interesting because he was like, wow, this is good. And we thought, uh oh, police. <laughs> Where do we run? Yeah, right, right. But then when he came here and he was kind of talking to us, and then he said, well, I'm kind of interested because, you know, I play the banjo, you know. And mm -hmm. So then we started getting into all the physics and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, that was. Good. That we didn't have very many people that day. That's why we came back figuring, you know, we're going to get some walk-bys. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I saw you because I, the lady that sells the apple cider donuts is a good yeah. friend of mine, so yeah. I sit with her on Saturdays. 
and then I, I know them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're famous now after yeah. being being here for one day. Yeah, we're getting to be regular. It's kind of like a homeless person, you know, it's like sits in the same spot every time. Yeah, just <laughs> when you put up a tent, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. How do you, like, how do you compensate for the different acoustic properties of each of these bodies? Are you using, like, an active? They do, they themselves do. What happens is, uh, an interesting thing, I don't, I play a cello, but I, a little bit, but I never realized that inside of those boxes, not only do they, you know, sand them and varnish them just right, like you know about that, but I didn't realize they put a post inside of them. And I thought the post was just to make sure that everything kind of works together, right? Well, they don't put it in the middle. They put it over on one side. And overall, with all the testing we've done, the very best overall instrument is the cello. It sort of handles as you might expect, but it won't dig as deep and it won't reach that peaky high that you want with the violins. And so mixing them up is, is the perfect way to do it. Plus it looks kind of neat because, you know, yeah. it just has sort of that ensemble look. So, and that's all we're here to do is to try to get public reaction, get people sort of like, well, what is that? How does that work? And oh, okay, I'll check out your YouTube channel and see, you know, how I could put these things together. That's what we're selling is basically take a look at our YouTube channel. It's pretty neat. I, I mean, yeah. like a, I would say I'm a, an audio hobbyist. Yeah. So like conventional loudspeaker behind your building. Right. So I thought this was interesting. I've seen things, you know, like, like where you'll mount the transducer for like a wall. Right. Or something like that. Right. These are actually made to be used inside vending machines, yeah. believe it or not. Believe yeah. <laughs> Cheap and vandal proof. Yeah. Um, but we also built some VoIP tubes and showed people how, you know, transmission lines work and all that kind of stuff. So we're trying to capture everything. We showed how helium, for example, I don't know, many people, uh, helium actually blocks sound. Like if you try, if you, you can do this even with a balloon, take a balloon and listen to the sounds around you. If you just want to talk or ask about it, come back. Plug your ear, put the balloon in front of this ear, and all of a sudden you can't hear through the balloon because of impedance matching. The gas is so light that when the vibrations are coming through from the noise source and they hit the helium, the helium atoms are so light, they don't pick up much energy from that movement of the balloon. And so on the other side of the balloon, they don't transmit much energy because it's like, you know, BBs versus, you know, shots. And so we showed how you can make thin panels with just a tiny little layer of uh, helium and you can block sound much more effectively than acoustic pads or lead or anything else just by filling the gap with helium. So it's like, oh, that's neat. You know, not only does it make it sound squeaky, yeah. but it also changes, you know, sound transmission. So lots, lots of different kinds of interesting things. Noise cancellation, you know, how you can compensate and phase match and that sort of thing. Is this uh, like your full-time gig now? Or? I used to be a physician, I retired. This is my son's full-time gig, and now that I'm retired, it's our full-time gig. We got about a million channel, a million subscribers, and we cover everything. I mean, What's the name of your channel? it's called Tech Ingredients. It's a little uh, QR code down there, okay. and uh, we cover rocket engines and food and lasers and you know all kinds of stuff. We did uh, vacuum chambers earlier on. We're building a real high-powered laser right now. You know, so it's tech. But at the same time, we try to keep it not so much like I'm showing off what I can do, uh -huh. as opposed to I built something that's pretty neat, but then at the same time, this is how you do it. Step one, step two, step three. So a lot of the stuff is approachable. It's not just sort of, you know, watching NASA or SpaceX or something like that, where it's like neat, but you can't do it. So everyone universally was impressed by the sound of these speakers, but most of the enthusiasm centered around the aesthetics, the fact that you can take tired old string instruments and simply convert them into excellent speakers generated the most interest and the most questions. I really like this project because it's easy, it's inexpensive, there's almost immediate gratification, and it's fun. I showed you earlier in the video how to assemble these. 
It doesn't require any special skills or tools, it takes a few minutes, and as soon as the adhesive is cured, you can have them up and playing in under an hour. The drivers, exciters, actuators, they go under a whole bunch of different monikers, are inexpensive as well. You can obtain these at Parts Express or on Amazon for between about five and thirty dollars. These are fifteen dollars and they're excellent. But the most fun is scrounging for the instruments. eBay, Craigslist, you can go to yard sales, antique stores, and as long as you're willing to shop around, you can obtain these things for a song. You can use them as you find them to give them character, or if they've got little nicks and scuffs and bumps, it's pretty easy to refinish them, put a new coat of varnish and make them look brand new. You can leave the neck and the scroll box in place for aesthetic purposes, or you can take it off as we did to make them more compact. It sounds the same either way. You can start with just a couple of instruments. But over time, as you accumulate more, you can build and build until eventually you have an orchestra. You can put a couple of these things on the side of your monitor in your TV room, your rec room, your church, a meeting hall. Anybody that comes in is going to turn to you and say, what the heck is that? And then you turn on the volume. And just like we discovered today, whoa, how did you do that? And you can tell them how. I want to thank you very much for watching. And I would ask you to do us a big favor. If you like the kind of stuff that we're doing on this channel, take a few seconds and subscribe. It really helps us out. And we're hoping to punch through a million subscribers this year. And with your help, I think we're going to get there. It also pushes YouTube to distribute our videos to a wider audience. And the bigger we get, the more we can afford to bring you. We've got some pretty ambitious projects on the drawing board. In addition, check back to the channel every so often for updates on our live stream series that we're going to be beginning soon. Despite subscribing, hitting the bell, and clicking on all, YouTube isn't particularly good about those notifications, and we'll give you a few days advance notice to give you a heads up. We're really looking forward to the live stream series because we're going to be covering science, engineering, technology, current events. We'll cover old projects, plans for future projects. We'll answer your questions and talk about just basically anything that you're interested in. Both of us are really interested in starting that series and it's going to start soon. So I want to thank you very much for your attention and your time. Stay safe, have fun, and I'll see you soon.